We're going to look at more of the financial markets. We're going to look at what the financial markets are telling us. I'm, I'm effectively the head of fixed income at Anchor, also the co-chief investment officer. And my, my speciality of fixed income means that I'm going to talk a little bit about the crisis. I'm then going to extend the conversation to what we are seeing in, um, in the financial markets and how we're interpreting that and what it's telling us about the crisis. So, so with that, I'm actually going to look at the crisis. Now I've got a storm cloud here and, and the challenge with this crisis is that it has been morphing and shifting over time. So the storm cloud's been moving around. First point to note is the storm cloud started in China and it pretty much moved to the West. So it went through Italy, through Europe, um, through the UK. And, you know, it looks like it's um, dissipating a little bit in Europe. People are getting back to work, um, you know, hospital beds are emptying up. Uh, it's moved across the United States and that's very, very shortly going to be the epicenter if it isn't already. It's not going to end there and it, it's possible looking at this trend to say that very, very much our next um, expectation is that this will move south. Latin America, South America is already looking quite precarious. Um, it's probably going to get worse there. And then in South Africa, um, our government is openly still saying that they expect this to peak in about September. So we're, we're still a way off the peak. That's actually got some profound implications for our economy, for ourselves, because by September, it's very realistic to expect that much of the developed markets have opened up, that the Germans are manufacturing <clears throat> you know, very, very good functional cars, the Italians are manufacturing very fun cars, and their worlds are starting to come back together. However, we're still in a very difficult space. I imagine you're um, you know, importing motor car parts from South Africa, suddenly that's creating linkage issues in terms of accessing parts. So what, what does that mean? It means from our perspective, if we are still closed down in September, a lot of the people to whom we are exporting in the developed markets are going to start to look for alternatives, are starting to look for substitutes. And that's just one of the things that is um, sort of starting to play on our minds. The other aspect of it, and I think Jonathan um, hit, um, sort of started this conversation, is the nature of the crisis is shifting. It started as a medical crisis. It's about people, it's about hospitals, it's about you know, keeping people alive. However, in South Africa, that is very quickly morphing into a humanitarian crisis. It's about hungry people, it's about people who can't survive, it's about people living in the streets. And that is equally um, challenging a crisis. We fully expect, along with um, what Jonathan was saying, that this will next morph into a um, economic crisis where businesses just become unable to survive. We, we haven't seen as of yet um, mass business rescues. We haven't seen the mass um, liquidations, but there are a lot of companies, a lot of businesses, um, a lot of sole proprietors that are exposed, that are at risk. And we think that that will be the next wave that pulls through South Africa. And then finally, when, when this all calms down, where are we going to be left? We're going to be left probably in a world where firstly inequality is likely to rise through this because the, the pain um, from, from the COVID crisis and how it's played out is being disproportionately shared by, by the people who can least afford it. So that, that's something that's in the back of our minds. The other aspect as investors, certainly in the fixed income space, is that we are seeing the, <clears throat> the, um, this play out as government spending a lot of money to maintain the system, a lot of necessary humanitarian support, but at the same time, tax revenues are dropped. So the government's already over-indebted and the over-indebtedness is, um, is going to increase quite significantly. Jonathan was saying that, you know, the companies that, that survive will be the ones with the strongest cash flows. Unfortunately, our South, South African government's net cash flow position has been negative and is about to become very negative. So that's also playing in the mind of the market. It's playing in the minds of how we invest. People often say that the fixed income market is the most um, clever market. I don't necessarily agree with that, but the reason they say that is that it does have some forecasting capability. So what I'm looking at here is a chart where we have got a f um, the forward rate agreements over time, the FRAs um, that are trading in the market. So forget all the technical jargon. What a FRA is, is it's basically a bet in the market as to where the interest rate will be. So a red line in the middle of the chart, which shows um, the current repo rate from the SA Reserve. 
against that, we've got the bars, which represent what the uh, market is saying to us um, interest rates are going to be. And if you look at the front digit, forget again about the technical jargon of how we number these things. The front digit is a one, so in one month's time, the market is expecting that the repo rate will be closer to about 4%. In two months time, about 4%, three months time, about 4%. And as you go across, you can see in 21 months time where the rate is. There are two messages we can take from this. The first is that the interest rate market fully expects that we will see at least one more interest rate cut of a half a percent. So that's what the market is pricing in. That's what the market is expecting. And it's quite significant that we're talking about the one month um, forward. So what the market is saying is that at the Reserve Bank's meeting, which is scheduled for the end of this month, there is a broad expectation that they will cut interest rates further by a half a percent. Interestingly though, if we go along the curve, what you will see here is somewhere around nine to 12 months, the interest rates start to go up again. So the market is saying that interest rates have come down quite drastically, they will come down further, but in about a year's time, we actually expect that we will be through the economic crisis at this stage, we'll be through all of this, and interest rates will start to normalize. In terms of normalizing, it's going to be a gradual process, and you can see the bots gently drift upwards, um, maybe you know, 25 um, points, a quarter percent interest rate hikes that sustain themselves for a longer period. And in, in two years time, we expect that the repo rate will be about 1% higher than it is today. So the market is pricing in for a recovery, it's pricing in for this to be about a year long process, and it's pricing in a very gradual normalization afterwards. Moving across to a chart that I, <clears throat> that I love, so I, sh I show it all the time, we actually look at the yield on South African government bonds. I'm looking here at the yield on the government R186 bond, which is about a six year bond, and it's, it's the benchmark bond for South Africa. What you have got is the jagged line, um, which bounces around all over the place and then shoots up and back down towards the That is the actual interest rate that the government is paying to borrow money. Um, it's, it's a fluid interest rate, it changes every day. There are market traders um, who, who are trading on the interest rate based on information that's available to them. Against that, what you have also got is the solid line, which is a lot more stable. And that basically is anchor goes, we put into all of our models, what um, you know, the various parameters, and we determine what we think the fair value or the fair interest rate is that the South African government should be paying. Sometimes the market can be irrational. And you can see the fair interest rate is reasonably stable over time. And then in the last few weeks, we've, we've had sort of int um, interest rate cuts that have pulled the interest rate down a bit. We've had um, obviously credit downgrades that pushed it up. But net net, we actually think that South African interest rates should continue to, to come lower in terms of the bond market. That, <clears throat> that has two effects for us. Firstly, long-term interest rates coming down should be very good for banks. It gives them access to, to cheaper funding. Um, in terms of regulatory rules, they need to borrow on a longer term basis. Than, than many of the other corporates would. So we think that that will continue to free up some capital for the banking sector. Additionally, though, if, if I'm an investor, what I would be doing is looking at this saying, look, when interest rates shot up to the top, um, Anchor Capital was thumping the table, publishing wherever it could that you should buy bonds. Um, yields have come down. There have been significant capital gains on those bonds, but we're not done yet. There is still opportunity in the fixed income asset class if you're an investor. There are still opportunities to lock in good yields. You will see further capital gains. And thereafter, you're still going to be left with an instrument that actually pays you an attractive yield. So from that perspective, we do think um, you know, that bonds remain attractive, albeit that some of, some of the opportunity has already crystallized itself in terms of profits for, um, for investors. But moving across to the, um, to the bond markets, and I want to look at it in another angle. Here. What we've got is a yield curve. Basically, what this amounts to is it is a graph that shows you the cost that the government pays to borrow money. So if the government is borrowing money for just two years, it's going to be paying around about 6%. If the government is borrowing money for about 10 years, it's paying somewhere between 10 and 11%. So depending on the amount of time that you're prepared to lend money to the government, obviously your risk premium um, goes up and you earn more um, for locking in money for a longer period of time. Very handy um, for us managing fixed income um, investments because we can figure out exactly you know, what we're going to be paid for pretty much any term to maturity. 
Looking at this though, it's got two messages for us. The first is this is incredibly steep in the front end. So if you're lending money for just two years, your interest rate is 6%, you go up to four years, you're pushing seven and a half, eight percent So terming out money in the short term, you earn an incredibly um, attractive sort of pickup yield. And then at about 10 years, it plateaus. It flattens off and it just bumbles along somewhere around about 11%. The bond market is basically saying that, remember this, fiscal shortfall we're talking about for our country, the fact that the government is sitting, it's um, very close to run, or it, it has run out of money, it's, it's not collecting enough taxes, and it's funding itself in the bond market. Unfortunately, that stress, elastic band can only go so far, and it will eventually snap. Generally, for emerging markets, that elastic band snaps at around about 100% debt to GDP. The bond market is basically saying to you that we've got about 10 years which is why um, after 10 years, that plateau is it, kind of at the elevated plateau. The risk, um, the risk at that point in time is that we need to have addressed the structural challenges in South Africa. Before, um, before then, we've still got time, and that's why the market is prepared to accept a low interest rate. So that's giving you a little bit of a sense of the runway that government's got left to adjust to the environment and um, to sort of, you know, fix some of the challenges that have, that have become apparent. Market is saying we've got 10 years. Last thing I would point out that, um, you know, what, what people say on bonds is that interest rates um, move inversely with bond prices. So what that means is that if interest rates come down, bond prices go up, you actually make a capital gain. Very important for us managing, managing investor money at the moment is we are investing money in the sort of six and 10 year area. And the reason is a bond has a finite maturity. Today we invest um, in a six year bond, in a year's time that's actually a five year bond. But look at what happens if I've invested in a six year bond at um, it's about eight and a half percent. In a year's time it's a five year bond and the market yield has dropped to about seven and a half. What you have got is the interest rates, as a bond approaches maturity, the expected interest rate drops very, very rapidly. And that's, uh, um, that gives you an uplift in bond values, gives you an uplift in capital gains, which is why um, all of our portfolios at the moment are focused very heavily on owning six and 10 year bonds. Firstly, the maturity date is before the market saying, look, we might have a problem here. And secondly, um, as, as the bonds approach maturity, they roll down the yield curve and we should see some good capital. We think there's exciting opportunities in the bond market right now. How do I invest? <clears throat> there really are, the way, the way this has played out, there really are four different fixed income inv investments that you can use. My computer is jumping around a bit today. Um, the money market investments, um, which have been the most stable, um, pretty much behave like a bank account. But the problem with those is as interest rates have been cut, we think that the yield on those will continue to come down. It's got a bit of a lag effect. But realistically, looking at money market investments, you should be earning in, in six months' time, you'll be earning somewhere between four and a half and five percent. So what most of our clients have been doing is uprisking. So they go into stable income funds that invest for a little bit longer. They can go further up the yield, um, that yield chart that I was showing you. And they're able to generate about 6% returns, again, with stable outcomes. Most of our clients, certainly in the retail space, have preferred the flexible income fund. So what that does is it basically blends in a little bit more long-dated bonds, a little bit, um, and it just goes a little bit further up that curve that I was showing you. And now it's able to um, earn an average yield of about 10.5%, um, or sorry, 7.5%. And that gives you a very attractive yield. It's definitely been um, Anchor's be, uh, most attractive product. Certainly we've seen the retail investors um, sort of take a big liking to this over the last month or so. And the advantage to this is you're getting a good yield of 7.5% is not what you were getting previously, um, but um, you're also able to lock in a good amount of capital preservation, a good amount of protection. So from that perspective, what we're seeing is um, it's giving the best balance of low risk, but still interesting enough interest rates for clients. And then finally, we have seen some clients who are looking to lock in the, um, the longer dated bond yields, the 10 and a half, 11% yields that I was talking about on that chart previously. And that's, that's investing in the longer dated bond funds. Obviously, it comes with more risk. Obviously, um, you know, if you're investing in um, 10, 15 year bonds, you will see some volatility in price. 
Um, but investors who are looking, who, you know, looking to live on interest income for a while and can maybe um, say they're not necessarily going to sell out of the investment um, seem to be gravitating towards that. So we have seen a structural shift in how people are saving and um, you know, people are certainly looking to defend their incomes right now um, and taking slightly longer term views on, on interest, on, on investments. Finally, I always get to talk about the RAND. Um, <clears throat> South Africa, or ANCA believes in the purchasing power parity model um, for, for RAND. So basically what we're saying is that the South African RAND should over time depreciate um, by approximately um, the inflation differential between South Africa and the US when we're measuring against the dollar. Our, our model holds true over longer periods of time. In fact, statistically, if you go and test this, it's, it's actually quite a st statistically significant model. Um, so, so we do believe um, it works. But in the short term, the value of the RAND can move pretty much anywhere, and we certainly have seen that. So what we've got here is a chart. The blue line with a bit of a sort of shadow around it is the um, anchor model fair value of the RAND. <clears throat> Against that, we got the red jagged line, which is the actual value that the RAND dollar was at over time. And you can see how the RAND, um, RAND dollar sometimes is above, above our line, sometimes it's below. And at the moment, the RAND dollar is actually quite stretched. It's quite far above our line. Certainly, um, <clears throat> you know, when, when we were pushing the 1935 RAND to a dollar previously, it was actually the most stretched it's ever been. It's come back a bit right now, so it certainly still is, is you know, the RAND is oversold. But it's not, you know, it's, it's not the worst it's ever been. How do we think this plays out? The first point to make is that in all of the announcements of action plans from the government, we have not seen anything that we think will increase inflation rates. We haven't seen, you know, so, some, some of the drastic ideas that have been touted, like, you know, printing money. We haven't seen the government um, actually take those, um, take those re realistically. We haven't seen any implementation. We therefore think that South African inflation isn't structurally going to change. In the short term, South African inflation is actually going to decline. Basically, people don't have money to go and spend. They have less money to go and spend. Oil prices have come down. So we see inflation actually dropping quite significantly. Maybe by you know, three, four months time, inflation is going to be printing with a sort of 2% handle on it, which was almost unthinkable a while back. So from that perspective, we actually think that this model will continue to hold true. The model is saying that the RAND should recover and the RAND will recover. I think that's general consensus when I look at all the um, financial um, commentators out there. The big question I keep getting asked is when? How long are we going to wait? If we look at the 9-11 um, uh, crisis um, in the States, it took you know, three, four months. Nenegay took up to six months. We think that this recovery will be quite slow. Remember the bond market is pricing in that this could be a one-year um, crisis. Um, we don't think that the, that the recovery is going to take place while you've still got uncertainty and volati uh, volatility in the de developed markets. So we need the developed markets to calm down. We need this to play out in the States. We need the States to recover. We need Europe to recover before the RAND can even start to recover. From, from that perspective, we think that the RAND will continue to be on the weaker side of fair. Um, and it may well take six to 12 months from here for the RAND to start to recover. When it does recover, the RAND does tend to recover quite quickly, so we would expect a sharper snapback. Um, but for now, what we have been doing is, is hedging and reducing our offshore exposure, um, currency exposure um, from the perspective of saying that, you know, we don't know when the RAND will snap back, but there's a more than um, a greater likelihood that this will occur. And therefore, we have been um, positioning, positioning rather um, cautiously in terms of offshore assets.